introduce you to Virginia Morrow. She's a widely published writer of science and natural history books and articles. She makes her home in Ashland, where she drove up from today with her husband and her dog. She's traveled the world, uh, the whole world, uh, in search of stories for her new book, Animal Wise. The critical and popular reception for her book has been resounding, as this turned out uh, is a continuing witness of the uh, interest that we all have in her subject. Animal Wise has garnered uh, laudatory reviews in places like the American Scholar and the Smithsonian Magazine, starred reviews in the Library Journal and Kirkus and many others, and it's only been out 10 days. <laughs> Reviewers are saying things such as this from Bark Magazine, this enthralling book might change the way we perceive other species who share the planet with us. A compelling read. Did you see, um, did you see the news last week on OSU Today, or maybe you saw it elsewhere, uh, about the felony charges brought against workers at a butterball factory farm who routinely brutalized turkeys? Uh, fascinating that, that we've come to that point. The story quoted an OSU poultry scientist saying that turkeys are smart animals with personalities and character and keen awareness of their surroundings. And that's domestic animals kept for slaughter. The story went on to say, in fact, animal behaviorists, veterinarians, and scientists now agree that turkeys are sensitive and intelligent animals with their own unique personalities, much like the dogs and cats we all know and love. And intelligent and sensitive even like ants and like rats, as Virginia Morrell chronicles in Animal Wise. In fact, everywhere scientists turn their attention, it seems they're finding evidence of awareness, choice, and ranges of emotional engagement that have previously been denied or minimized. I think, or at least I hope, that we may be in the midst of a sea change in our consciousness of our kinship with all other animals. If so, that change just got a nice boost from this wonderful book. Please help me welcome Virginia Morrell. Thank you, Charles. And Thanks to all of you who've come out this evening to hear about my new book. It's a pleasure to see such a fabulous audience and we be happy to even change auditoriums. And I also want to thank uh, Bill Ripple. I don't know if he's here this evening or not. I know he'll be at the symposium tomorrow, but Bill uh, is a person who I've written about his research quite a bit for the journal Science, and Bill then introduced uh, me to Charles Goodrich. And, so I want to thank Charles again and the Spring uh, Creek Project for inviting me to speak to you this evening. And I also want to thank my husband and fellow writer, Michael McRae, who uh, not only drove my, my, me and my our dog, dog Buckaroo up here from Ashland, but he critiqued and edited every chapter that I wrote in this book before I sent it off to my editor at Crown. And he's not only a wonderful writer and editor, uh, he's also a fabulous cook, and I can give you an idea, we would eat things while he, he, he was cooking dinner for me while I was writing, and so uh, he would call dinner, you know, and I'd go downstairs and he would serve something like a long, longuini with a fresh baby vegetables braised in olive oil with herbs. <laughs> so, so needless to say, I ate well, or salmon encrusted with a Dijon mustard grilled. <laughs> so tonight I'm going to share with you some of the stories about the animals and the scientists that I met while researching Animal Wise, and I tell their stories in my book. At its heart, Animal Wise is a book about how our fellow animals experience and see the world. It's a book about animal minds. But it's also about the scientists who are researching the minds of animals, their thoughts and emotions, and finding ways into what was once considered sort of forbidden territory. There was a time, um, primarily in the last century, when psychologists in particular felt that it was wrong to suppose that animals had any 
thing that would suggest that it was a thought. Instead, all you looked at were their behaviors. In fact, when I started doing research for the uh, story for National Geographic, which led to this book, I met an animal, animal behaviorist who told me that I shouldn't be writing that story, that I shouldn't be asking the kinds of questions that I was asking that we couldn't possibly know. And later, I met another biologist and I was ex explaining to him what this researcher had said to me. He said, well, you know, when someone tells you that you can't write about something or you can't research something, that's when you know it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> He said you were right to persist and to continue with your book and your studies. So I'll get, show you some slides and read you some passages from my book. Um, some of the slides are about the animals that I met. Get myself organized here. Um, first, I'd like to show you a picture of my collie, <laughs> who is the most beautiful collie, of course, and very smart. This is Buckaroo. And he's in the car waiting for us. He's an American working farm colleague. We say he's unemployed because he only has um, myself, my husband, and actually the Blue Jays in our yard to tend, but he does a good job. And we have a very shy calico kitty named Nini. This is about as good a picture as I've ever gotten of her. <laughs> she doesn't like cameras, and she only loves me. <laughs> so. <laughs> So this is a thing, you know, we all project emotions and thoughts onto our animals, but how do we really know this? I would say, you know, Nini's very shy, Buck is very exuberant, but how do we know this? Are we just projecting or doing what scientists say we should never do, which is to anthropomorphize? And basically what that means is that you're giving human thoughts or human emotions to uh, furry creatures, turning them basically furry or feathered creatures into humans. And the scientists that I interviewed and spent time with for my book, um, they worry about that all the time. They don't want to project their thoughts, their ideas, their emotions onto the animals they're studying. They want to know what that animal is thinking, how that animal experiences the world, what is it like to be that animal. And of course it's a big challenge to figure out how you're going to do that. How do you get into the mind of another species, especially one that you can't talk to? Well, one of the first things that researchers noticed about animals uh, came from Jane Goodall's studies at Gami Street in Tanzania. And I was fortunate enough, my husband and I were fortunate enough to go there in 1987 and spent time with Jane. I was researching a biography about the Leafy family titled Ancestral Passions. And Jane Goodall had been started in her research uh, by Louis Leakey. And she hadn't any formal training. So when she came to study the chimpanzees, she wasn't, um, she didn't have these ideas that animals couldn't have thoughts or emotions or personalities. And she began attributing all of these things to the chimps. She even made the mistake in her first science paper of referring to them by their sexes. So uh, a chimpanzee that was a male, she would refer to him with the pronoun he, or female chimpanzee, she. And an editor at one of the science journals went through and changed all of those pronouns to it. And she went back through, good hearted Jane, and she changed them all back to their pronouns. And she wrote in the margin, she said, at least give them the dignity of their sex. <laughs> it does make a difference in how they behave if it's a male or a female. They're not just cogs in a machine. So while we were there in, at, at Gami, we met, uh, we always saw just a lot of wonderful behaviors, and uh, there was a pair very much like this pair, although this is a mother and her young chimpanzee, but we met a pair of chimpanzees. It was an adult male, Beethoven, who was caring for a little orphan chimpanzee named Dilly. And I won't go through the whole story, you can read it in my book, but Dilly deceived Beethoven very clearly. And she got this banana that Jane had hidden to one side for her, and she ate it without Beethoven knowing about it. And after we saw that, we got together with Jane and I said, wow, that was a wonderful demonstration of how a chimpanzee can deceive another. And aren't you going to write this up for a science journal? And she said, oh, no, I can't do that. I said, why not? And she said, well, the other scientists will accuse me of anthropomorphizing. They'll say, Jane, oh, how silly of you. That's just an anecdote. She said, the only thing I can do is to write about it in an indirect way. I can say, 
it was, if, if Dilly were a human, we would say that she deceived Beethoven, or Dilly behaved as if she was deceiving Beethoven. But you couldn't come out, and this was 1987, that recently, you couldn't come out and just say, this champion, chimpanzee deceived another. We, that was like attributing a human thought to another animal. Over the years, of course, that's changed, and part of the change was because of Jane's study, her insistence on things such as the fact that the sex of the animal mattered in its society, as did its personality, and then uh, other, an other animal researchers began to notice personality traits in their animals. One of my favorite was the discovery of personality in octopuses, which isn't the first you know, animal that would spring to mind that would have a personality, but uh, there, was, there was work done that showed that fish have personalities, some are shy and some are bold, and the researchers at the Seattle Aquarium noticed the same behavior in their octopus. There was one who was, when you would clean his aquarium, he would just be, his arms would be like all over you. And so if they called him Leisure Suit Larry. <laughs> and, there, and there was another, there was another octopus who was so shy and retiring, she could squeeze, you know, this is a big animal, but she could squeeze her 25 pound self down to hide behind a little, in a little tiny space that was about three inches square when they cleaned her aquarium. She, of course, was Emily Dickinson. <laughs> so personality pretty early on uh, in the 80s and 90s began to be accepted, and there's a whole field of research now that's devoted to animal personality. In addition to that, uh, scientists began making discoveries about animals that supposedly had really tiny, insignificant brains and couldn't do a thing, such as fish could use tools. And here we see a wrasse who's got a clam in its mouth and it's going to take it someplace and then use a stone to break, break it open. They found out things about whales, such as this humpback whale. Not only do they have beautiful songs, they have regional accents. So do cows. <laughs> Sheep remember faces. Songbirds like this western tanager practice their songs in their sleep, just like we practice things that we're trying to learn. Moths remember what they ate when they were caterpillars. Dogs like this border collie, and so far only border collies, can have amazing vocabularies. This is Betsy, and she was the cover dog on, my, on the issue of National Geographic and March 2008, when I did a story about animal minds, which led to my book, and I met Betsy. She had a vocabulary of 350 words. She knew the names of all of her toys, and if you asked her to go get the hamburger, she would bring you the hamburger. Um, but she was outdone by another dog who had a vocabulary like that of 1,022 words, Chaser in South Carolina, also a border collie. The owner of that dog said Chaser could have learned more words as Betsy could have her owner didn't have enough time, and, and Chaser's owner got tired of teaching the dog the names of toys. He couldn't remember all the names of the toys. <laughs> he, he had to have a list, and then he would write the name on the toy. But you could ask Chaser to get anything, get the red ball, you know, and he would bring, she, or she would bring the red ball. So, but it is something specific to border collies, and that, of course, interests scientists, because uh, being able to do that, it's, as, it's a kind of symbolism, knowing that the sound of something stands for an object. And not only that, these border collies know that if you show them just a, a paper representation, such as a photograph of a toy, and say, go get that toy by name, the dog will do it. Also a little miniature representation of the toy. So they really have some understanding of symbolism. Okay, so you want to study animals. One of the big things that scientists discovered was that really to know what's going on with them, and this again is something that Jane pointed out and showed was so important, you have to know the individual animal. You have to know who each one is, you want to know how they fit into their society, what each one is doing, if you're really going to understand how they think. So, they all look alike. How do you tell them apart? One way, depends on the species, but with lions what they discovered is that you can look at their whisker spots and all of the whisker spots have a different pattern. So you take photographs of the lions and you have those cards with you when you're out watching your lions and you can tell them apart. They might have scars on their faces, uh, tears on their ears, things like that. Uh, with humpback whales, what they found is that each whale's tail has a different pattern. So here's a white one, 
Here's one that has a little bit more black on it. So you take photographs of all the whales in your study population and you try to remember those patterns. And again, the scientists usually travel along with uh, photographs of the tails to, so that they can remember who they're seeing. With elephants, uh, it's the tears of the designs on their ears, the ragged edges of their ears. It can be the shape of their trunk, the shape of their tusks. Getting back to dolphins, it's the shape of the dorsal fin. And this one just has a very small nick. Let's see if I get this to work right here. That's a small design pattern on that one. I was with researchers in Western Australia uh, watching wild dolphins that live in a place called Shark Bay, which gives you an idea of who else lives there. And uh, one of the, well, many of those dolphins had very extremely decorated um, dorsal fins because of the bites of the sharks that they uh, suffered and survived. And one was so um, impressive that the scientists called it wow. <laughs> it was missing almost its entire dorsal fin, but it had survived. What do you do, though, if you are going to study a species like an ant? And you've got a colony of these little guys. They're cinnamon colored. They're all about the size of a hyphen. To really see them, you have to look at them under a microscope. And you want to study them. They live in a little crevice in England. And you, bring, you go out to the crevice, and you suck them all up with your aspirator. And you bring them back. You have 200 individuals. You have the whole colony. They're living in, your, in the Petri dish. How do you know who they are? You paint them. <laughs> That's what Nigel Franks has done in England. Each one of his ants has a separate design. He has hundreds of these colonies. And because he knows all of the individuals, he can then give them challenge tests. These ants, uh, as I said, they live in a little rock crevice. He can mimic that by making a house for them out of slides of cardboard and glass. He cuts a little tiny like, miniature, miniature mouse hole in there. And the little ants go inside, and they set up home. Everything's going along swimmingly. And suddenly what happens, someone, some horrible person, takes the top of the, of the house off, this lifts off the top slide, and instantly you're exposed to the elements. That causes you to have to find a new home. And Nigel Franks uses that home-finding tendency of these rock ants to then give them challenge tests. And he, by doing that, he will give them, a, say, a choice of a new home in another Petri dish. They have to reach it by going over an acetate tape bridge. And then he can see how, what the decisions they make uh, in searching for a new home. And he's done hundreds of experiments this way. This is his setup. Uh, he'll put the ants in their Petri dish and then put a couple other Petri dishes out there. He films everything, that way he can go back and review what everybody in the colony did because everybody has a, their own unique little painted pattern. And by doing this, he discovered that the ants do, well, they do amazing things. They measure the size of their home. They look to see where the entrances are. They won't choose a home that's too large or too small. They don't like a home that has nasty neighbors next door or, or that has dead ant bodies scattered around. Good heavens, we don't want to live here. So um, by doing this, he also found that these ants do a form of teaching. And uh, what happens is that when the ants have to find a new home, the scout ants go out first, the brave ones, and they look and they find the new place. And then they have to come back and lead the other ants in the colony to this new home. This is because this particular species of ant doesn't really rely on a scent trail, a chemical trail. Instead, they memorize the landmarks around them. It would be like us walking down the streets of Manhattan and memorizing all the skyscrapers as we walk down the streets. That's what these little ants are doing in their little tiny brains. And so here we have, in the front, we have the scout ant. She knows the way to the home. And we have her pupil back here who doesn't. And there was a definition of teaching at the time that had been around for about 20 years. And Nigel Franks realized that what his ants were doing fulfilled all the criteria that the psychologists had laid out about what constitutes teaching. No one else had been able to do that for any of their animals, chimpanzees, you know, rats, um, dolphins. None of these animals had been shown to be able to teach or do all the things that psychologists said teaching entailed until Nigel came along with his ants and said, this is teaching. 
And what, what, how he did it was to show that this little ant in the foreground here, she waits until the ant in the back learns the lesson. And every step of the way, it's a very start-stop little journey they make back to that nest. But this little ant will wait for her, her pupil to learn. This one will tap her on the back, okay, I've got that part of the trail memorized. And then they continue on to the nest like that. So he published a paper in the journal Nature, which is a very prominent British science journal, uh, and uh, was called T Teaching in Ants. <laughs> and so, of course, it was hugely controversial, and the psychologists scurried around, and they redefined teaching so that it would exclude the ants. <laughs> this usual, the usual response, if an animal can do something that we can do, we have to redefine it. So uh, they wrote a new, they added to the definition that the teacher also had to know that the pupil didn't know what it needed to learn. So, hmm. so Nigel went back and he looked at his ants and he thought, well, they know that too. And so he wrote another paper and published in an equally prominent journal titled Teaching with Evaluation in Ants. <laughs> uh, not to, to say that ants only have aren't the only small animal with a big brain. Fish are too, just to, I don't want to be Marco Rubio up here, so just a moment. <laughs> so there, uh, there was a researcher in Germany I went to see who works with fish, and I'll read you a little bit about what he, he says regarding fish. He studies a, a kind of fish, these are called archer fish, and what they do is they shoot a blast of prey, or sorry, a blast of water at their prey, at an insect or a lizard or something that's sitting on a branch. And they make all these complex calculations, which is what Stefan Schuster in Germany has shown. And they have to calculate things such as the force that the animal is using to hang onto that branch or that leaf, and then they adjust the amount of water that they shoot at that animal. Uh, they also have to calculate, you know, the distance and where the animal is going to drop into the water. And they do all of this in this uh, flash of a second. So he doesn't think that there's any reason that fish or insects, small brain animals, cannot be intelligent. Intelligent circuitry can be assembled in any brain. That's my big belief, Stefan Schuster told me. It's not limited to those animals with large brains and many neurons. If evolution requires it, this kind of intelligent circuitry, if, if, sorry, if evolution requires it, that is, this kind of intelligent circuitry, it will be assembled, even with a small number of neurons. Fish might seem an unlikely animal for a researcher to use as an example of an organism capable of making intelligence, intelligent complex decisions which is one reason that Schuster uses them. People don't expect much from fish, he said, but that's where they're wrong. Fish are capable of much more than people think. So then I went in to meet his archer fish. And this is a picture of them shooting at the prey. So you get an idea, this is what they do. They shoot sort of water bullets. The archer fish caught my eye the moment I walked into the lab. Eight silver and black dappled fish looking back at me from inside a wide square tank. As big as the palm of my hand and shiny, they were shaped like Paleolithic arrowheads, broad and flat with pointy heads. They weren't swimming in slow laps or zooming back and forth as aquarium fish often do. They were lined up in a row at the front of the tank, their dime-sized black eyes fixed on us. There was something so expectant in their pose and attentive gaze then I turned to Schuster and asked, are they waiting for you? As soon as I said that, I blushed, and I thought to myself, what a stupid question. Of course the fish aren't waiting for him. But Schuster was beaming. Yes, yes, it looks that way, he said, stretching his neck toward the tank. I noticed that he didn't get too close. They have these large eyes, and they do watch us as we move around the room. They shoot at us, too, said, <laughs> said Mario Voss, one of Schuster's graduate students like this. Voss stepped up to the tank and leaned his head over the edge. The fish turned toward him, and in the next second, one blasted Voss in the eye with a sharp jet of water. Ow! cried Voss, jerking his head back and laughing as he wiped away the water. A good shot. <laughs> Thomas Schlegel, who was completing his doctorate, didn't approach the tank. 
He'd been dodging water bullets for four years, and he was tired of being a target. They'd shoot us in the eyes and the nostrils all the time, he said. It can be irritating after the 30th time in one day. But, but you should try it. I was game. I stepped to the tank's edge, leaned in, and concentrated on keeping my eyes open. Which fish would be the shooter? The fish were all facing me, but one in particular seemed to be staring directly at my left, uh, left eye, like a hunter targeting his prey. Wham! The water hit my pupil with such force that I jerked back, just as Voss had. It was like being shot by your kid brother's high-pressure water pistol. Laughing, I wiped my eye but stayed by the tank, my left hand resting on its edge. Another fish quickly seized the opportunity to blast the diamond in my engagement ring, while a third targeted the red carnelian stones in my earrings, and yet another shot my right eye. <laughs> they are really good, I said, but do, but do they think my eyes and earrings are insects? Oh, I think they can tell what is an eye and a nose or earrings, Schuster said. They don't really ex react like they expect this prey to fall into the water. But eyes and noses do interest them. Maybe they just like our reaction, added Schlegel. Most of, the t most of the time it must be boring for them, since they're just waiting for us to set up experiments. <laughs> Shooting our eyes might be fun. We stood there in a row, the four of us, looking at the row of archerfish who had lined up again to look back at us. What were they thinking? One of the archerfish waggled his head, stopped, and did it again. I could never prove it, but I always think when he does that, he's trying to get me to feed him, said Schlegel. His laptop sat open on a desk beside the tank, which is where he usually worked. He sat with his back to the fish. Sometimes I get the feeling they're watching me, he said. And then when I turn around to look at them, there they are, lined up like this, like waiting like dogs for their humans. They try to catch your attention. Most people don't look for learning or playful behavior or thinking or feelings in fish, said Schuster. They think they're just, you know, wet vegetables. <laughs> Carrots or cabbages with fins. Then they meet our archer fish. The fish look at them and shoot them in the eyes. <laughs> And immediately people think, well, these fish are intelligent. <laughs> so I'll let you read about what else he shows with the archer fish. Then I went to Oxford, England to meet Alex Kasalnik, who works with a kind of crow called the New Caledonian Crows. In their native habitat, they uh, make tools and use these to hunt for grubs and maggots. They make little spears. So he brought, he brought uh, some... New Caledonian crows back to an aviary in, in Oxford, and he wanted to see what else these could do. This is a particular crow named Betty, and he'd set up an experiment for Betty. He put this little test tube out there. It has a basket in it and a little piece of meat, and then he put two pieces of wire in the area for Betty. One had a hook in it, and one was straight. But before the experiment unfolded, just at the same time, another crow came swooping in to the area and stole that little hook. So all Betty was going to have now was a straight piece of wire. It was a type of material she'd never seen before. Betty flies into this experimental setup. She doesn't hesitate. She marches right over to that piece of wire. She picks it up. She marches over to kind of a tray that was there in, this, in the experimental setup, and it has a little bit of a lip. She sticks one end of the wire beneath this lip, and she walks it a little bit with it, the other end, and so it bends the wire, and she has a tool. She has a hook that she herself has made, and she walks over, and this is a picture of her using that tool that she made. This was not trained, this was first time, and this is a picture of what Betty <coughs> did, which was remarkable because, as Alex Kselnick said, it means that she had in her mind, her bird brain, an image of what it was she wanted to make. So his study, and then research by other bird researchers, uh, has really changed what we think about bird brains, too. One of the things Alex told me, he said, you know, while you're investigating birds, you really must go meet one of the birds that got us all started, and it's the only animal you're actually going to be able to talk to. And that is Alex, the African gray parrot. 
So I called up Irene Pepperberg, who is at Brandeis University, and I went to meet uh, Alex the Great Pepper, or sorry, Alex the African Great Pe Parrot, along with Irene Pepperberg, who has worked with him since he was uh, about one year old. And Alex the African Great Parrot died a couple of years ago, but I was able to meet him before he passed away. And Irene's idea at the time, none of the, uh, what we know about bird brains now is that they really aren't that different from our own. It used to be thought they were missing a lot of the key pieces of anatomy which make reasoning and the kind of thinking we do possible. But it was just that people had uh, missed parts of the anatomy of bird brains. And so we know now that they have many, basically all the same pieces that we have, they're just arranged differently. Instead of being, as one researcher put it, like a club sandwich the way ours are, theirs are more like a pizza and sort of spread out on top. And I, Irene's idea was that if she taught Alex how to imitate English words, she could then ask some questions about what was going on in his bird brain. Could he understand some abstract thoughts, such as, you know, color and shape? And this would be Alex doing one of his color and shape tests. And I'll read you about my visit with Alex. With Alex. Everyone can hear okay, is that? Yeah, okay. I mean, it was quite exciting to hear Alex first speak. Uh, so we walked, she and I walked to the back of the room where Alex is sitting on top of his cage. He stopped at Irene's approach and opened his beak first words from Alex that I heard. Want grape, Alex said. <laughs> he hasn't had his breakfast yet, Irene explained, so he's a little put out. <laughs> Alex closed his eyelids halfway, hunched his shoulders, and looked at her. His narrowed eyelids and hunch made him look crabby. <laughs> Don't look at me like that, Irene said to him. See, I can do it too. She narrowed her eyes and gave him a stony look, imitating his expression. Alex responded by bending his head and pulling up the feathers on his breast. To me, she said, he's in a bad mood because he's molting, and sometimes when he's like that, he won't work. She spoke to Alex again. You'll get your breakfast in a moment. Want wheat, Alex said. So they get a bowl together. They've got various things, um, grapes, green beans, apple and banana slices, shredded wheat, corn on the cob. Irene held up the sliced fruits and vegetables for Alex, who seized them with his beak. If he didn't want something like the green beans, he said, nah, meaning no. <laughs> it was an emphatic nah, short and decisive. His voice had a slightly nasal and digitized quality, but it was also tinny and sweet, like the voice of a cartoon character. It made you smile. So he was also learning how to say some words while I was there. He was learning to count to six and learning the sounds for seven and eight. I'm sure he already knows both numbers, Irene said. He'll probably be able to count to ten, but he's still learning to say the words. It takes far more time to teach him certain sounds than I ever imagined. He had to figure out how to vibrate his vocal cords to imitate English words. Alex was also learning to say the word brown. As a kind of learning aid for brown, Irene placed a small wooden block painted chocolate brown next to Alex. After breakfast, he, would, he used his claw to pick up the toy block and held it aloft as if showing it to everyone in the room. Then he opened his beak. Tell me what color? <laughs> brown, Alex. The color is brown. Pepperberg, the, um, her lab manager and her assistant replied in a kind of sing-song unison, unison. Alex listened silently. Sometimes he tried to part of the word brown. Other times he would hold up the block again and repeat his question, what color? And the trio of humans replied together, brown, Alex, the color is brown. Then Alex switched to the number seven. Sanon, that's good, Pepperberg said, seven, the number is seven. Sanon, Sanon. He's practicing, she explained when I asked what on earth Alex was doing. That's how he learns. He's thinking about how to say that word, how to use his vocal tract to make the correct sound. It sounded a bit mad, the idea of a bird willingly engaging in lessons and learning, but after listening to and watching Alex, I found it difficult to argue with Irene's explanation. She wasn't handing him treats for the repetitious work or wrapping him on the claws to make him say the sounds. 
So she would do something in this case where she would say, um, how same? And Alex would reply, color. And how different? Shape. And afterwards, after she worked with him for a while, she began to work with another one of her birds, which was when he offered final proof of the mind inside his bird brain. The bird was having trouble saying the word green. Talk clearly, Alex commanded. <laughs> Talk clearly. <laughs> Don't be a smart aleck, Pepperberg said, shaking her head at him. He knows all this and he gets bored, so he interrupts the others, or he gives the wrong answer just to be obstinate. <laughs> at this stage, he's like a teenage son. He's moody and I'm never sure what he'll do. Wanna go tree, Alex said in a tiny voice. Alex had lived his entire life in captivity but he knew that beyond the lab store there was a hallway and a tall window framing a leafy elm tree. He liked to see the tree, so Irene put her hand out for him to climb aboard. She walked him down the hall into the tree's green light. Good boy, good birdie, Alex said, bobbing on her hand. Yes, you're a good boy, you're a good birdie, and she kissed his feathered head. And Alex died uh, just about two years after I met him. So it was a big loss for Irene and, and a big loss for the people studying bird cognition because by then they realized that birds really do have uh, interesting brains to study. And the one bird that we could ask a lot of questions of died. And we wonder, you know, why can parrots make, do this? Why can they imitate our voices? Do they do this in the wild? And the answer is no. I joined a parrot researcher, Carl Berg, who is studying a small parrot called the green rumped parrotlet in Venezuela. And he's been able to show that these little birds, uh, which are about this size, have signature contact calls. And we know that certain other animals, like dolphins, have signature contact whistles, and that the, which they imitate. They can imitate each other's sound. It's what scientists call uh, vocal learning. And both these parrots and the dolphins are lifelong vocal learners, which is what we are. And the best way to explain what that is is, for instance, when I met Charles for the first time, and I'd say, well, what is your name? And uh, he would introduce himself. He would say, Charles. Well, I can say his name because I can listen, and I have the vocal anatomy in order to repeat what he said to me. And that's called vocal learning. That's what these little parrots do and many other parrots in the wild. So what Carl's trying to do is to find out what else the parrots are putting with a name. Once you're able to name someone, you can add things to it. You can say, well, you know, Tom's a jerk, or Bob's really cool, or, <laughs> or the couple next door, Sue and Tom, boy, are they something else. So here he is, he's holding this little bird, and uh, what happens when another little parrot comes down with the tree right next to us and they exchange little sounds. They both go beep. One says beep and then beep. And that's what sounds like to us what the parrots are saying. But as Carl discovered, you know, that in that little peep there is much more information. Their calls are so fast we can't hear what's in that peep. So Carl played it for me one time. Uh, at one point, he just played a couple of their calls so that you could hear it slow down and it sounded sort of like <laughs> But to our ears, it sounds like peep. So he can't study the other sound because it doesn't make any sense to it. So how does Carl do it? He makes, he goes back to all of his calls and he collects calls of known birds that are doing various things and then he puts them into a computer and the computer produces a sonogram, which is a picture of the sound. And then he has the computer compare the different sounds. So when Bob is flying back to his nest where his mate is waiting for him, she should be calling him, he's calling her. And that, in fact, uh, is what his study showed. And she will only come up out of her nest if it's Bob. And this is what the scientists have done there in Venezuela to study these birds. They live, fortunately, uh, in little, uh, they make their nests rather in, in little hollows inside fence posts, and so they were able to duplicate that with these PVC pipes, and they made 120 um, nesting boxes like this one, and they can take the top off and the bottom off, they can put cameras in so they can watch what everybody's doing. 
and they've kept track of these birds now for <coughs> almost um, 20 some years. And inside their homes, uh, as the babies hatch, as the chicks hatch, they get rather crowded. So there's mom, poor mom here. <laughs> Boy, kids, it's time to leave. Well, some of them, it is time to leave, you know, like fledged Timmy already. So <laughs> these, these little chicks, uh, the way that these parrots work is that they lay their eggs asynchronously so the birds hatch at different ages. And so what happens when Timmy back here leaves the nest and he's not really full grown, he's, he's going to hang out in the crush area or a bunch of other little baby parrotlets. How are you going to find Timmy? What happens is that Timmy's out there and he has his own signature contact call. And Carl's very close to showing that the parents are actually giving these calls to their chicks, that they aren't born with that call, that it's something that the parents assign to them. And so she will call, when she's looking for Timmy, she'll come out of her nest and she'll say, you know, basically, Timmy, Timmy, Timmy. And he'll say, Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. <laughs> and they can get back together. That's essentially how, how it works. Because when we're lost, if we're in a fair or we're at the mall, we don't call our name, we call our friend's name, right? Or our mom's name. That's the way it works. So that seems to be what the parrots are doing. And we know now there was just a study out about two weeks ago with dolphins doing the same thing. Um, so here we have a situation where we know that bird brains have got a lot more going on in them. And we come to an animal that's often used as a stand-in for ourselves. And um, this man, Yak Panksip, at the University of Washington in Pullman, he's studying rats, and his real interest is in um, happiness and, the, and in being joyful. And he wants to know how that works, but he can't get money for that. So what does he get money for? To, to study depression. But, <laughs> <laughs> but in order to study depression, you have to have not only your control, the neutral animals, you have to have happy animals. So he has depressed rats and he has happy rats. And uh, one of the things he noticed about his happy rats was that, and the way you get happy rats is you let them play a lot together when they're young. And he noticed that when they played together, their mouths would be open. And uh, so he wondered, well, what, was, what sound was coming out of those little mouths? No one had ever asked this question. All the years that rats have been used in laboratory research. So he figured out that it probably was beyond our hearing ability. So he put a bat detector in the cage of the rats and discovered that the playful rats were laughing. And he, he was able to listen to this and then also to make a sonograms of it and show that the pattern was very similar to our form of laughing. And I would say he's probably also tickled more rats than anyone else <laughs> in the world. But he found that rats like us have tickled skin, like you tickle kids, you know, and so rats uh, love to be tickled. And what's important about that is that he showed that the rats that are allowed to play together and have fun and laugh and play, it's a way to learn how to control your emotions and control the expression of your emotions, and that later on in life, say a male rat gets together with a female rat, and maybe there's a guy there, another rat, who never got to play and is more a depressed individual. Um, she won't be interested in that fellow. She wants the guy who played and knows how to control his emotions, how to control his aggressiveness, how to behave around him. So it's useful play. What do we do about studying emotions in an animal like an elephant, though? I mean, you can study them, rats, you know, you've got them in captivity, you can do a lot of different things. But when you've got an animal the size of an elephant, how do you go about trying to find out what's in their minds? And these particular elephants, they're walking along past researchers in Amboseli National Park, Kenya, where I visited with researchers who were using uh, what are called playback experiments to get inside the elephant's mind. And here you can see the elephants coming along, and some of them have got their trunk up like that as they're walking by us. And one of the researchers said to me, you see her, she's doing that because she smells you. <laughs> and she knows that you, she knows that you don't belong in the car with us, you're new. And she's going, ew, mommy, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, Karen McComb, who's an 
animal vocalization specialist. She studied the calls of horses and cats and elephants and red deer and her assistant, Graham Shannon. And they, with their work, with, along with Cynthia Moss, who's a, been studying the elephants of Anticelli since the 1970s, they've been able to show that it's the uh, matriarchs of, within a herd of elephants who really makes most of the key decisions. And they do that by doing these playback calls. And I'm going to play a clip if I can manage this. They showed me how to do it, so hang on just a second. Now this is, a, this is one of their experiments showing how elephants, this is a herd of females, the matriarch is the leader, and she's off to um, the left there. She's going to respond as they listen to the playback calls of four male elephants, or so, sorry, four male lions, who are very dangerous because they're males, they can bring down a calf. So we'll see them first moving. And I hope the sounds of the lions plays. Here it comes. See them all listening. called that bunching behavior shows that they are um, coming together to make a decision about what to do next. Now they are very suspicious about lions. You can see this lion knows that elephants know about them and they really don't, elephants really do not like to be ambushed and so when they hear an ele or lion calls like those four, they oftentimes will go to investigate actually go and challenge the lions because the last thing they want is to be attacked uh, without knowing that the lions are there. And so they are aware of lions and it's primarily the matriarch who can distinguish between whether a pride has got a fe uh, besides female lions, if there's a male within that, within that group of lions that's also roaring, it's only the matriarch, the oldest lion, who, who knows that. One of the other things that we want to know about lions, or sorry, elephants, of course, is their feelings about death. We know that they are very curious about the skulls and the bones of other elephants that have died, and they'll spend a lot of time, like these elephants are, uh, investigating um, the bones of the other, other elephants. And that was another experiment that Karen and Cynthia did. They put out uh, the bones of the elephants, and they put out bones of giraffe, and hippopotamus, and the only ones that the elephants were interested in were those of other elephants. Right before I got to Amboseli, there had been a bad drought, and many of the oldest matriarchs had died, and so the researchers had saved all of the skulls. Here's Karen with these, and they were going to do another experiment to see if not only did the elephants recognize the bones of elephants, but do they know the bones of individual elephants? And so she has the skulls of these animals who are known individuals. They know what group herd they belong to, and they were going to be doing experiments to test that, to see if the elephants are grieving for particular individuals. So dolphins, are, of course, are another one of these species that you really wonder a lot about. And I went to meet a researcher in uh, Hawaii, who worked with uh, dolphins in captivity, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about what he did. He did the, truly an amazing thing. He found a way to communicate with the dolphins by making a kind of language that showed that they would understand grammar. It, he said it doesn't show that they have a language themselves, but it does show that their minds are capable of understanding a grammar. And the language that he invented for them was all gestures. So he was showing me some films about what his dolphins could do. This is Alele. He said, and he showed a film of her following the trainer's directions. And the sentence went, surfboard, dorsal fin, touch. Without hesitating, Alele swam to the surfboard and leaning to one side, she gently laid her dorsal fin on it, which was an untrained behavior. 
The trainer stretched her arms straight up, signaling, hooray, and a lele leaped into the air, squeaking and clicking with delight. To accomplish this task, a lele had to understand the gesture directions and to use a body part, her fin, that she could not see, but pictured in her brain. A lele just loved to be right, Herman said, and she loved inventing things. We made up a sign for create, which asked a dolphin to create its own behavior. Dolphins often synchronize their movements in the wild. You know, the type of behavior like these two dolphins in Shark Bay leaping together side by side. But scientists don't know what signals they use to plan their moves or to stay so tightly coordinated. Lou Herman thought he might be able to find out how they did it through his pupils. So in this film, Akea Kimai and Phoenix are asked to create a behavior and to do it together. The two dolphins swim away from the side of the pool they circle together underwater for about 10 seconds, then they leap out of the water. They spin clockwise while erect and while squirting water from their mouths, every maneuver done at the same instant. None of this was trained, Herman said, and it looks to us absolutely mysterious. We don't know how they do it or did it. And he never will. Akea Kamai and Phoenix and Alele and the two others died in 2003 after developing an infection that did not respond to treatments. I might try again, Herman said. It's why we're here in these temporary quarters. We're thinking about a new program. But he shrugged and his voice trailed off. He was an emeritus professor now, busy with another study of humpback whales in the wild. He wasn't sure about beginning again, especially with captive dolphins. I loved our dolphins. Herman said, as I'm sure you love your pets. But it was more than that, more than the love you have for a pet. The dolphins were our colleagues. That's the only word that fits. They were our partners in this research, guiding us into all the capabilities of their minds. When they died, it was like losing our children. Herman pulled a photograph from one of his files. In it, he's in the pool with Phoenix, who rests her head on his shoulder. He's smiling and reaching back to embrace her. She's sleek and silvery with appealingly large eyes, and she looks to be smiling too, as dolphins always do. It's an image of love between two beings, two vastly different creatures, one of land and one of sea, having what Herman said he had most wanted with his dolphins, a meeting of the minds. From the dolphins, I also went to be a researcher in Japan who has an extraordinary relationship with his captive chimpanzees. This is uh, Professor Tetsuro Matsusawa at the Primate Research Institute in Kyoto, Japan. And the chimpanzee in the foreground is Ai, and the chimpanzee in the back is her son, Ayumu. And he started working with Ai when he was just uh, at his well, it was his first position there at the Research Institute, and he had a senior advisor who had acquired a captive chimpanzee. His I, she was a little tiny chimp. And uh, Matsusawa, the only research he'd done previously with animals was with rats. This was 1976, and of course today we don't do this any longer, bring in chimpanzees from the wild for captive research, but by Doing what he did uh, with his chimpanzees, Matsusawa has improved the life of chimpanzees in captivity in Japan and has seen to it that they're no longer used for medical research. I knew nothing about chimpanzees, he recalled about being asked to study this little chimp. I was in the basement. I named her I, he said, which is Japanese for love. And the basement was all concrete with no windows and a single light bulb bulb hanging from the ceiling. In the middle of the room there was a log and a tiny, tiny chimpanzee, about 12 inches tall, sitting on it. I had no idea about chimpanzees and I was so amazed. She looked into my eyes and I looked into hers. If she'd been a monkey, she would have screamed because staring like that is a threat in most species. But no, she just sat quietly and gently looking. So I knew, this is not a monkey, this is something new to me, a different creature. Unsure of what to do, Matsusawa made a gesture that one eyes trust. He unfastened the cuff on his white lab coat and he gave it to her. She held the cuff for a moment and then slipped it onto her own arm and ran it up and down her limb like a bracelet. 
Then she slipped the cuff off and handed it back to the young professor. A monkey, Matsusawa said, probably would have eaten the cuff or torn it apart. So, right from day one, I began to teach me something new. I realized she is a special creature, and I took her out of the basement, and I put her on the sunny side of the building, still in a cage. It was not such a good life for her at first, but we have learned and made many improvements. And what they've done there is to, well, he went to see chimpanzees in the wild, too, and he realized then that the chimpanzees really prefer to be overhead. That's where they live in the trees. So there in their laboratory set up all of the catwalks are overhead for the chimpanzees. They're always above the scientists. And when the scientists work with them, they're either on equal footing with them as in this photograph, or they sit in like kindergartner chairs so that they're lower than the chimps. This is a, a picture of some of the tests that they do. They've given the chimpanzees a lot of uh, computer screen tests and discovered a lot of things of, about the chimpanzees' mental abilities with abstract thinking that way. And I, or Ayuma, this is the son of I, he happens to be a real memory whiz. And he can do a kind of, it's like he has uh, an eidetic memory, it's such a photographic memory that, memory that you can put these numbers up on the screen in a random pattern, just flash them on the screen and it disappears and then he can uh, touch the numbers again in the order that they had previously been seen. People can't do this, and it's so annoying folks when uh, Matsusawa first published that study that there was one group of scientists here in the States who then worked very hard, and he showed me when I was there, they just published a paper that said, uh, the title of it was, uh, Graduate Students with Training Are As Good as a Chimpanzee at This <laughs> So some of those curious things, really, we have to be better at everything. <laughs> Dogs, too, can take computer tests. This is researchers in Austria and uh, Hungary who found out that, it, well, there was this idea that dogs couldn't do, wouldn't be interested because these are two-dimensional screens, but in fact, they love these um, computer tests. This dog, Guinness, is a border collie. She's doing a matching to sample. So she's, a, she's owned by a researcher named Frederica Rage, who works with um, Sofia Varani. And uh, Sofia and um, Frederica are working with the, both dogs and wolves to do a comparison of what, how dogs change from their wolf ancestors. So she has some young wolf puppies there. And uh, there she is with her dog Toter, who is sort of like the elder to the wolf puppies. I spent a bit of time with them, and uh, here's another shot to show you just how they all get along. This is Guinness with some of the wolf puppies. And um, I met this particular wolf when she was a bit younger, Tatanka, and I'll just read you the passage quickly. Hope I'm not going too much over time. Um, about this experiment that was so interesting. and really begins to show something about the difference between the minds of dogs and wolves. We went to a meadow and Rani did a quick training session to teach Tatanga to look her in the eye, something that's difficult for wolves as it is for most wild animals because staring is generally a threat. She asked Tatanga to sit a few feet in front of her and held up a treat for her at arm level. Each time Tatanga met her gaze, Rani snapped a clicker while simultaneously tossing her the treat. Sometimes Tatanga looked straight at Varani, other times she tilted her head from side to side as if unsure where to focus. She can only manage it for a second or she'll look at me from the corner of her eye, Varani said after the two minute lesson. The wolves know they must do something to get that treat, but they really aren't sure what it is. They think maybe it's about moving their head in a particular way, which is why she does that funny head wobble and even when they figure it out, they can't do it like a dog does, looking openly into your eyes. It's like, uh, when I speak to my dog, Toter, he turns instantly to focus on me, to gaze at my eyes. It's like he's asking, what do you want to do? Or, what do you want me for? Wolves don't think that way. They're too busy thinking for themselves. <laughs> so in my book, I talk about the how uh, wolves became Dogs, and this is a, a fox that's uh, in ex in a part of an experimental group in uh, Russia, and they show that if you keep selecting the tamest fox, that eventually they begin to look a little bit like dogs. They get spotted coats and curly tails, and they love people. 
What is it about people and dogs? In France's oldest decorated cave, archaeologists have traced images of animals, lions, horses, rhinos, and elephants that the artists of 26,000 years ago painted on the rock walls. They found the skulls of cave bears and measured the tracks of cave bear paw prints. In one chamber, they found the footprint of a child. There are no other human footprints with this young person who stood about four and a half feet tall, but there is another footprint nearby, a dog's or a dog wolf's, some kind of a hybrid. They know the canid was more dog than wolf because of the length of its middle toe, which is like a dog's. The archaeologists investing the cave cannot say for certain if the child and dog were together or if they came to the cave at separate times. Most of us, though, would say the dog and the child were surely there together and that they were friends, looking out for each other. So natural does it seem, even 26,000 years ago, for humans and dogs to be a pair, working together as a team. This was me with Ayumo, and of course, by the end of seeing all of these animals, you feel a closeness to them. And I'll just end with the last part of my book about how I came to think about all of these animals and their minds. There is grandeur in this view of life, Darwin concluded at the end of On the Origin of Species about the powers of natural selection. Through natural selection, he wrote, endless forms, most beautiful and wonderful, have been and are being evolved. By forms, Darwin meant the splendid variety of physical shapes and structures of animals, the simple fleshy tubes of worms, the hard jewel-like encasements of beetles, the basic forelimbs and one head body plan of vertebrates, clothed in scales, feathers, fur, or a veil of body hair. No matter how different our morphology, we animals are basically alike because of our shared evolutionary past. But animal bodies are not empty forms. They're equipped with sensory cells and brains. In his later works, Darwin argued that these internal structures and their accompanying thoughts and emotions evolved as well. With the endless forms have come endlessly beautiful and wonderful minds. It is our good fortune to be living among them. It is a tragedy to lose a single one to extinction. What do the minds of animals tell us about ourselves? That, like us, they think and feel and experience the world. That they have moments of anger and sorrow and love. Their animal minds tell us that they are our kin. Now that we know this, will our relationship with them change? Thank you very much for being such a wonderful audience.